my shout hallelujah.
Praise God. Was it? Did it test? Yeah, there I am. Praise God. Um, and uh, let's turn that heat back. Good Lord. It got warm in here, didn't it? Well, some of you didn't. It got, it got hot to me. I know some of you out there sweating if it's hot to me. Oh, Jerry's cold. Okay. <laughs> Go sit in my office, Jerry. That's one of the things we've got to do. We've got to get uh, somewhere here and balance these systems. It's uh, You go in the kitchen, we're hanging tobacco. And uh, I think some places build, we've got meat stored. So, uh, we, uh, like I said, I think I told somebody the other day, you could uh, go and experience the equator in Antarctica in, just in five minutes. As I, uh, at the school, our school was like that. So, hot. I mean, one place you got to have on coats and put on heaters, and another place you got, you know, Tell them to keep the clothes on because they're, they're about to strip. It's hot. So praise God. We're glad you're here. Jesus is Lord. Can somebody say hallelujah? hallelujah. Amen. Are, are we out on the internet? Okay. Yeah, my little, I was trying to make sure I was sharing it, but it ain't doing what it's supposed to do. So, oh, well. Hallelujah. Well, welcome back. Those who haven't been back since the first of the year, we're glad to see you. And, um, Trust that you had a wonderful Christmas and a marvelous New Year. Um, why are your Christmas stuff still up? Well, yesterday was Orthodox Christmas. Uh, Eastern Orthodox Church celebrated Christmas yesterday on the 7th. And so we, uh, I just believe in getting all of them. Hallelujah. So we get, you know, um, I, I got family members, you know, Christmas night. At midnight, they're taking stuff down. It's over. I'm like, no, it's not. we got two more weeks. You know, the Epiphany and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, o Orthodox Christmas. And, um, you know, so I'm going to keep take it right on out to at least Orthodox. And then usually to the end of the month just because I think it's cool. Amen. Hallelujah. So anyway, um, let's see what's going on. Back on regular full-blown service schedules. Okay. Uh, prayer. Will be this Tuesday night. Some of us, uh, we apparently didn't get that information that good enough last week. Prayer will resume on Tuesday night at seven o'clock via Zoom. Uh, if you would like to um, be involved in that meeting, it was, it's closed and comes by invitation. In other words, you can send an email. And we will invite you. All right. We just don't put it out there. There's, sometimes you just don't want everybody on the planet z uh, zipping in on your meetings. You know. And uh, so, we, you know, because that, that this way we can control, um, so anybody in the church, but, you know, you don't want some atheist uh, church hater to get on there and start saying stuff in the middle of your Zoom meeting. You know, that's, that's not the purpose. So um, if you're interested, email office at expedition, expeditiontriad.org and just say, hi, I want to be involved in the Zoom prayer meeting, and we will um, add your email address to that and send you the link on Tuesdays, okay? And uh, so you can link, click in and link in to us and be a part of it. Amen? Hallelujah. Or you can subscribe to Fifth uh, Expedition Church's Google Calendar, and it will have that on there as a link, and you can get in there that way. Amen. If it, do we have a QR code? There is a QR code. So if you got your phone out real quick, you can hit that and grab it when it floats by. Hallelujah. Brother Bill's at, just looking real hard. Hallelujah. Um, you're wondering, if you're wondering why we still have Faith Victory Church on our Square Cash app, the IRS has not acknowledged that we have had our name changed with them yet. We've Six months we've been waiting for them to acknowledge. But there's 87,000 extra agents you'd think they would be able to uh, at least run that paperwork through real quick. But no. They have acknowledged they received it. They have not acknowledged that they have changed it. Because, you know, we, we are legally no longer the other name. I don't even want to say it because then I'll start, I'll start saying it in announcements. The former name of the church. All right? Hallelujah. And um, so we're, I think we're about to make an executive decision just to go ahead and change it with Square app, Cash App and just, you know, Deal with it when they call. Say, hey, that's there you go. QR code right there. You want to be part of you can QR code that with your phone and, and um, get in on that. Praise God. All righty. So Tuesday night prayer, Wednesday night midweek service. And um, we are going to begin 
And it's, of course, it's January. It's going to be kind of late. We're going to resume um, something we haven't done since we moved out of the business park. And that is going to be going back to Wednesday night um, meal. There we go. So we're going to go back. So we're going to we're ease in. We're going to ease in on every other month on second Tuesday, Wednesday night of the month. We're we, we having a dinner. All right. So it's going to be things, I don't know, like soup, chicken and pastry, spaghetti, you know, different meals like that that are, um, we can come early to church. You can eat, fellowship, hang out, get to know one another better if you don't already. And um, there's no better place to get to know folks than to sit down and eat with them. You learn a lot about people eating with them. It's amazing how people get, uh, get loose lips when they eat. <laughs> They'll tell you everything. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So. Uh, February will be our first one on the second. We don't know that we don't know the menu. It, it, we might not decide till the day before. All right, Hallelujah! But we will be going on a a um, second Wednesday night every other month uh, Wednesday night dinner. All right, and of course this summer we'll have our we'll have the uh, picnic during the summer. Of course the fall fellowship of Eastwick style barbecue and fried chicken will always be on the calendar until Jesus comes back. And if if he doesn't mind, I might do it in heaven. Okay, <laughs> hallelujah, <laughs> glory to God, and uh, so that's, and then we're working on the calendar for the year of other things, outreaches, etc. This, this is our year of focus on reaching the community, reaching out, amen. We got our building, we got our land, now it's time to fill it, amen. And what kind of service we're going to have, we're going to have us a what? We're going to have us a service today, right? Man, if you weren't here, if you were not here Wednesday night, I encourage you to go back and listen to the service. Okay, it is it is a visionary speaking forth about thing service, and we want you to speak. It wasn't one. We didn't have a catchphrase. You know, we're going to arrive in, in you know. I mean, it's what's it three? Uh, it's going to be us. It's going to be me in twenty three, or you know, um, I, I try to think of rhyming words. Uh, you know, um, victory in twenty three. You know, huh? What's that? Miracles you'll see in twenty. I like that one now. Hallelujah. Praise God. All right. We have visiting. The, uh, I guess kind of, you can't really call it visiting, but uh, Steve and Miriam Winfrey are with us today. Have, we haven't seen them in a long time, so we're glad to see y'all. And uh, we, we've missed you. We're glad to see you. And they brought friends, Ronnie, uh, the, the Poplars, Poplin, Poplin, it's Poplin. I, I, went same, I went and got mixed up again. Uh, Ronnie and his wife, Carol. I, I, I missed that the first time around. Apparently, I missed the last name around. <laughs> Hallelujah. And they're visiting. Now, they are visiting with us for the first time. So we're glad to have you all today. And God bless you for coming. And trust you all be blessed in the service. Amen. Hallelujah. A lot of you all remember the wedding. How, how many remember were here? When, okay. All right. Benny, you were here. You remember the Winfrey's, don't you? You've got to remember the Winfrey's. You were here. You've been here for longer than they were. Or as long. Amen. Hallelujah. They remember you. <laughs> there you go. Went to a restaurant the other day, and this 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 uh, server comes up and goes, uh, "Are you still there?" I had my my Southern Guilford shirt, and I said, "Yeah." He said, "I went to Southern Guilford." I said, "Oh, well, when?" He said, "2016." I said, uh, then when did, "I said when did you graduate?" He said, "I didn't." He said, "When were you there?" "2016." I said, "You remember me?" He said, "Yeah." I, said, well, I don't remember you, but hey, good to see you. <laughs> Hallelujah, glory to God. He, but he remembered me. I guess I'm rememberable. <laughs> All right. It is time to give. If you need an offering, I there are still a few left out there. Uh, very few. I had so many plans this weekend of getting those to the printer. That was my goal this weekend. And uh, I bumped my head on the goalpost or something. I didn't make it. <clears throat> um, if you need an offering envelope, if not otherwise, through ca Square Cash or PayPal, uh, you can get your cash app ready. We're going to pray. Jesus said, to give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. Amen. Malachi, or if you're Italian, Malachi, said, you know, bring all the tithe and the offer into the storehouse and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open unto you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, you shall not have room enough to receive. Giving is a financial um, plan of God for your prosperity and for the support of the kingdom of God. Amen. Uh, we, we, we obviously don't get government subsidies. <laughs> yeah, they, they don't, they don't, um, they'll, they'll give millions of dollars of some, some crazy stuff, but they don't give them to the church. 
And so um, anyway, we, we depend upon in the kingdom of God the people's obedience to tithing and giving and uh, to do the work of God. Amen? Hallelujah. So, and as we're, we're, some of you weren't here last week, uh, Jessica and, Kat and Chris, um, somebody kept calling you Chris. Oh, be more. I was talking to on the phone the other day. kept calling you Chris. I'm thinking, who's Chris? <laughs> oh, it's my son-in-law. We all call him Cap. That's all we've ever called is Cap. Never called him Chris. And, and, and then I got one relative calls him Christopher. Christopher. Like, Chris, who is Chris? Oh, yeah. Man, we, we, don't, we just don't. Nobody calls him Chris. Do you call him Chris? Oh, in other words, when, when she's being wifey, when she's being wifey. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Christopher Scott. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Anyway, hallelujah. They are, they are um, scheduled for a missions trip this summer. We won't give you the details online uh, because of the country they're going into. And, um, but they are going into a country where it, they will be there for uh, about six weeks. We're leaving a missionary uh, to then to come stateside in, on a furlough and to raise funds for their ministry, and they'll be running the, uh, their ministry and their uh, other uh, aspects of what they do over there. No, because, you know, uh, they might, oh, are we not at visually either? We'll be right back. And um, designate it to Capel. Hallelujah. That's for that this missions, ministry trip, for loving a missionary and ministering themselves at the same time during that time. <coughs> All righty. Let's go ahead and give in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we thank you for the offering. Thank you for the heaven, windows of heaven to open unto us. You empty out on us blessings. We don't have room enough to receive. The people are blessed coming in and going out in accordance with your word. And we thank you, Father, that the, that the things, the uh, kingdom of God is financed. The kingdom of God is sustained, and the kingdom of God advances because people are faithful to obey your word and do what you said in Jesus' name. Everybody agree with that? Said, Amen. Amen. Go ahead, Brother Joe, receive the in house offering. Rest of you send that. And then uh, once he has uh, passed everybody, then we're going to permit the um, young, young people to head back.
Hallelujah. All right, you're out of here, guys. Don't knock each other down getting there. Okay, we're in slow mo today. All righty. Go ahead and open your Bibles, if you will, to the 29th chapter of the book of Jeremiah. If you were with us last Sunday, or watch us online. I hope, I hope if you weren't with us, you did, you were able to watch us online. Um, we started the year out with a, a special message, and um, about God is, and we covered that. You know, God is number one for you. God is in you. God is with you. God is beside you. God is beneath you. God is upon you, and God is the one who uh, comes up and is your rear guard. Amen. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Hallelujah. And um, I am trying to get this, make sure that service, be, oh, I was trying to make sure I had shared my service, but I'm just not getting the information to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it from my phone today. Thank you. There it goes. Because I'll share it and tag me. That really makes me have to do that. All right. And so um, we, we gave you encouragement to know that, number one, God is for you. It's so important to understand God is for you. That, that, that alone should eliminate a lot of woe is me stuff as a believer. Now, I'm never going to get there. I'm never going to make it. I'm, not, I'm just whining, you know. Um, and, and a lot of times we're whining just because we don't know. But God is for you. Now, if God is for me, then what did the Scripture say? Who can be against me? Yeah. Amen. Amen. And then, you know, Paul talks about all this stuff and talks about, you know, that neither life nor death, the things present, the things to come. You know, angels, it goes on and says, um, she'll be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. So we talked about, you know, that God is in our lives, for, in, with on, beneath, beside, under, you know, uh, and then it's our rear guard. And then, then that begs the question, why? To what end and what, to, uh, what avail is God all these things to us? Is it just simply so we can just kind of, you know, walk around and float in the sky with our little angel wings and play in the harp? Now, you, we know we don't have that. We don't get our wings. We don't become angels. Okay, I'm just, try, just trying to give you a visual some of us we don't want to see us like, like a fat baby clothes playing a harp okay <laughs> don't even want to visualize that do you <clears throat> well there's a reason jeremiah 29 11 says this for i know the thoughts that i think toward you saith the lord thoughts of peace and not of evil and not of evil so i say not of evil See, God doesn't have a great big human swatter in heaven waiting for you to mess up so he can make you a grease spot on the earth. He's not looking to take you out. Why? He's for you. He's for you. Remember he said, even while we were dead in our trespasses and sins, he quickened us together and made us alive together in Christ Jesus and raised us up together and made us sit. Where's Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father? God is for you. Say it again. God is for me. <clears throat> See, in his thoughts of you, his thoughts toward you are thoughts of peace and not of evil. To what? To give you an expected end. Now, another translation says to give you a hope and a future. Thank God there is hope. But I want you to notice another word in there, future. See, God planned a future for you. God has a designated future for you. You're not just down here kind of milling through life like a peon, you know, in a communist country, getting up every day and doing this and doing that, you know, and then you die. God has a future for you. God has a purpose for you. God has a destiny for you. Now, <clears throat> as Christians, that doesn't mean everybody's got destined to preach in the pulpit. See? Sometimes we look, and, and let me say this. If you're not called 
you don't want it. I can tell you flat out, if you're not called, you don't want it. You might think you do, but you don't. Hello? You may love the Lord, and you I just love to be preached. No, you don't. Well, I mean, you know, you might see the big guy on TV, and you might see the big church, and you might see, listen, there's all kinds of stuff that goes with ministry you don't ever see. Okay? And I can tell you, you know, and, and you know, and if I wasn't called, I wouldn't want it, especially after being, being in ministry for a number of years. You kind of go, Ooh, no, mm-mm. Not, no, no, don't want that, okay? Well, it takes anointing to do, do, do ministry. It does, okay? And um, we, we kind of, as Christians, sometimes think that if we're not in front, if we're not teaching, if we're not preaching, if we're not doing that, then God, what, what kind of anointing or purpose can God have for my life? Understand, Every part of the body. Paul wrote in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, and every part supplies. Every part has a purpose. Every part is valuable to the kingdom of God. Y'all, I hope y'all know this, but at your little toe, you'd have to learn how to balance yourself. That little bitty toe. You know, the one stuck down there in your shoe right now. Some of you haven't washed in a week. Stinky toe down in there. Stuck in them shoes, sweating. But without that little toe, you can't walk properly. And you, until, you, until you relearn balance, it's, it's, in, it's vital to your balance. You have organs that nobody will ever see, hopefully. <clears throat> okay? That are vital to your existence. And there, then there's purposes in the kingdom of God, people, that you, people will never see. People will never know about but are vital to the kingdom of God. And see, God has a plan for you. God has a purpose for you. God has a destiny for you. Amen? Hallelujah. And all too often, we're, we're, uh, we're frustrated because of the big mouth Christians. You all know what I mean by them? They're the ones always bragging about everything they know. Well, I'll tell you what, God told me to do this. God called me there. and I mean, you can go on and on and on. You know, God showed me. I remember I had a I had a roommate. Had a roommate in Ramah, you know, and he saw his angel every day. I I don't mean occasionally. Every day. There's my angel over there. He's outside the car. He's right over here. He's over there. And I'm I'm like, Where is he? I wasn't seeing any angels. To this day, I don't know that I ever have. Okay? Now, the Bible says we've entertained angels unawares. That could be, but I, did, I wasn't aware of it. And I don't believe, and I'm not going to say, now let's not jump on the other side of the ditch and say, well, now that supernatural stuff ever happens. I'm not trying to say that. But when you start seeing angels all day long every day, I have to begin to wonder. Spiritual things vainly puffed up in your head. Bible does talk about that too. Okay? And so, you know, because of his, his constantly bragging about him seeing angels. And then you hear the Christians walk around going, well, God said, God told me, 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 God told me. Then you begin to wonder if you're even spiritual at all. I mean, you think, man, I am lost. I am out without God. I am actually in hell right now. Because I don't ever hear anything out of God. God don't speak to me. Okay? And if you, that, that can begin to shape and to form our um, understanding of the kingdom of God in a negative way. And because we're not having these constant experiences, we begin to wonder, what is my purpose? What is my calling? Why am I even here? Now, let me say something, folks. Um, I've been, I've been in ministry now well over 30 years. Been a Christian uh, 40, be 44 years this year. Been a believer. I haven't had a vision even on the average of once a year. I've had two or three clear visions in that period of time. 
They were significant. They were altering. They were important. But I don't have them all the time. Okay? Now, I, I, others, we know others have more. Brother Hagen did. He wrote his book. He had eight major visions before the 87 camp meeting vision. Okay? That happens. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying people can't. But don't let that kind of thing begin to suppress you in the thoughts that you have about you and your walk with God and your spirituality to the point that if I'm not having this and I'm not having that, then I must, I must not be, God must not even need me. I mean, why does he need me? He's got, you know, um, he's got visionary over here. He's got angel guy over there. And then he's got Joe. He talks him all down. He ain't got time to talk to me because he's too busy talking to Joe. Okay? That, that's wrong. I say that's wrong. It, it, will hurt, it will hurt you. You've got to understand God has a purpose for you. God has a calling for you. And um, you won't always know what that, that whole picture looks like. See, a lot of you want the whole picture. But you remember the Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight. If God, now when God called Abraham, did he tell him, what did he tell him? He wasn't very clear. Get thee out of thy kindred, from thy get out of thy father's house, from away from thy kindred, and go into a place that I will show you. He had to start out without knowing where he was going. Hello? Then you get to talk to some people, well, God told me the next week I'll be here, next week I'll be there, next week I'll be over here, and he's, he's showing me the whole thing already. Now, I don't know. That sounds more like, that don't sound quite like the Bible. Go into a place that I would, he had to step out in faith and start moving with God. Amen. So let me say this. The Bible doesn't have, we don't have in the Bible where all the characters knew exactly what they were doing when they started obeying God. Our biblical people in the Bible, our examples in the Bible, our heroes of the hall of faith don't have the whole picture. Why? Because they walked by, had to walk by faith. And so in your walk with the Lord, as far as what your purpose is, what your destiny is, and what am I ever going to do, and, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm such and such years old, the years are passing me by. How many know who Kenneth Hagin is? Or what? Well, he still is. He's not here. He's in heaven. Raise your hand. All right. Okay. And I think we got about 100% in here. All right. Now, Brother Hagin was in ministry for years. You know, until about 1957, until he was 57, that his ministry really exploded? Mm-hmm. He was in his late 50s, and he passed away at 87. He was in his late 50s when it, all the stuff really just began to explode, and the, you know, the camp meetings, and the Rainbow Bible Training College, and the, you know, I mean, the tens of thousands showing up for meetings, and, you know, and, and all over the world stuff. He, he's out there traveling, doing that, doing down there, you know, obeying God for decades, because he went to ministry at about 17. So about 40 years of his ministry were done in somewhat of ob obscurity. So we remember how people finish and never check out how they started. Amen. Our Bible characters, our Bible uh, heroes of Hall of Faith in Hebrews 11th chapter are full of people. We remember how they finished. But we didn't re don't really research too much how they, how they started. Amen? I mean, Samson got in there. Think about it. Why? Did we, why? we remember him killing the Philistines. On the, the, he killed more in his death than he did in his whole life. Amen? So um, the Bible characters didn't all know everything. Matter of fact, they may have had an idea. I knew God, when God called me, there were some things I knew. One thing I knew at that point in time was I would preach in the Orient. It took 20 plus years. Actually, to the time I stepped off the plane in Bangkok, Thailand, from that time, I was born again in 1979. That was 1999. It was 20 years before that ever came to pass. So much so, I almost forgot about it. Hello. But that was just one event. God, I, there's things that I didn't know. 
<coughs> when, I, when I first got born again, I didn't think I was called a pastor. I went to Raymond Bible Training College, and let me tell you something. Back then, you didn't, pastor was like it was like the worst cuss word you could come up with. Everybody at Brahma was called to be a prophet and teacher, like Dad Hagen. That's what they all said. All of us. Ask somebody, what are you called? To? I'm called. Nobody, you didn't hear anybody go, but I'm called the pastor. Nobody ever said it. Even if they were thinking it, they wouldn't say it. Because they would look at you like, oh. Got the, got, the, got the garlic and the crosses. You know, get some sunlight in here. Got that. It's like a cuss word. And I'll never forget, I graduated, I come back home, I'm, I'm planning on the worldwide Edward Taylor Ministries, the man of faith and power. We're taking the nation's glory to God. Going to do it single-handedly. I don't even need y'all, I do it all by myself. <laughs> and I'm sitting in church with a Wednesday night, sitting on the front row, and I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, I'm sitting in the service, pastor's preaching, and um, something hits me in the top of the head, and goes all over me and said, I called you the pastor. And I thought, what? But that anointing was so strong. And I'm like, okay. Now I don't, and I'm, I'm thinking, you know, now I know how prophet and teacher works. I've seen that. I've been watching that. You know, I say, I've got, I'm, I'm getting this down, you know. Now you got to understand. I never was a, a, a teacher. You know, I'm a, I'm a preacher who will teach, but I love to preach. I, I mean, I would just, I, I love to preach. All right? But the Bible says, you know, you got to be, as a pastor, you got to be apt to teach. So we do that. But I like to preach. But when that hit me, I knew I'm called the pastor. Well, it, I'd been saved at that point for about three years. So what you know wasn't like it just you know all of a sudden I, I got born again I knew everything. Amen. And other things came into being and other things came to pass and uh, different different aspects of ministry over the years have been revealed as we've gone. Or just like this building I was sharing this morning. You know. I thought for years we we're going to build out on the 68 corridor. That's where we're going to go. We're going to get right in southern because we're going to be so big. You know. And so grandiosa. And we are called to do it all. We're going to be out there in the middle of everything so everybody can get to us real easy. And when God put Pleasant Garden out there, and I'm, and I'm struggling because, you know, you know, Jeff, the realtor, <coughs> after, we, after that building fell through in, in East Fork Road in Greensboro with the 1.75 acres of land. That's what happened. Which you could build on. We could have built on that. We could have taken that old... Dumpy building that smelled funky. Fix it up, use it for a little while, then build a building. And we and it was it was it was um, it had already been rated for the property for eleven uh, for eleven thousand square foot building, which was a nice size. Double what we had in the business park. Okay, so that's about four hundred people plus classrooms and offices. You know, that'd been a nice size building. Yeah, we could do that. And uh, that fell through, and <laughs> thank God it did. <laughs> well, at the time you're disappointed. Lord, will we ever get a building, you know? And we're ever going to get to have our own place. Um, you know, we just want to quit. And then the realtor calls and says, hey, look, I, I want to send you something. I want you to consider it. Look at it. He sends it over. And he says, well, it's in Pleasant Garden. And I'm saying, I'm musing on Pleasant Garden. It's a nice name. It's out in the sticks. Uh, that's how you think. It's way out. Well, 4.3 miles from Interstate 85, that's not exactly the sticks. You know what I'm saying? Now, I have been in the sticks before. This really isn't in the sticks. Okay? And um, with Nathan. Nathan wants to go hunting on some of these um, game lands, North Carolina game lands. And I would go with him, you know, just to, you know, be company because I don't hunt. But, you know, they're in the sticks. <laughs> You're going down the road, and all of a sudden there's just this NC Department of whatever sign, wildlife sign on the side of the road, and you turn in there and you're wondering if, if the, uh, the Hatfields and McCoys were shooting across the field at each other. Okay? And so I'm sitting there thinking, but Lord, 68. And that's when he asked me the question, how many more churches can go on 68? 
You got the Church of 68. You got Triad Church. You got North of Town uh, Summit Church. You got right over on the county line, uh, Cross, uh, Crossroads Church. You got uh, this going on and that going on. How many more? He said, who will take care of my people out there? End of discussion. <laughs> End of discussion. We're not having, okay, I got it, Lord. So then we came out and looked at it, you know. Everybody knew it was the right place. We all moved in. Here we are. All right. But see, I'm thinking one thing. See, and here you're going to go through life. You might be thinking one thing, and it take a completely different turn. Because, see, you don't know everything about every step of the way of God bringing you into your purpose and destiny. Amen. And so you just have to, get, you have to, get, listen, go along for the ride. Walk by faith. Obey God. Do what God says in the process. Amen. Be led by the Spirit of God. They that are led by the Spirit of God, the sons of God. Can you say amen? And um, keep, keep, uh, <coughs> excuse me. That was, I, that was building for a few couple of minutes and I was trying to fight it off, but it finally won. Hallelujah. Out you come. All right, there you go. Now, Here's another thing. So number one, nobody knows everything. You'd be looking at, okay, now the Lord said on February, da, 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 I'm going to do this. Okay, it's, okay, now we can go do this. There are things about the walk of God. Well, no, about things. Everything about the walk of God requires living by faith. Taking this step and not understanding why you're going this direction, but that's where the Lord's leading. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Um, I can't leave this alone. My, you know, I'm, our, our um, uh, alumni, RMI director, Doug Jones, we were in a meeting a couple of years, took a couple, three years ago, and he said, you know, guys, y'all been telling Dad Hagen stories your whole ministry. He said, it's time for you to tell your own stories. Yeah. Now, there's some I still pull dads up, but he, thought he was right. Because he, he said, you've been in ministry long enough, you should have stories to tell. That are personal and experiential to you. Amen. I thought, well, that, that's, that's good, Brother Doug. Now, occasionally there's some stuff I just, but when Brother Hagin's story fits real good, we can still use it. But we have our own stories. And see, my story. See, when the Lord called me to ministry, he called me to pastor. I, was a, I, was, um, I had been a Pentecostal holiness. I grew up Pentecostal holiness, in case y'all you don't know that, that's what I was. I was a Pentecostal holiness boy. Okay? Grandma would tell me I needed to be rooted and grounded in holiness. What she meant was the ma manual of the Pentecostal holiness church. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, I'm saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Pray for me that I hold true to the end. Bless his holy name. That was our testimony meeting. And that's about all you got. I mean, everybody. You know, they, they wanted to stand up, and we just, it's like a repeat of everybody in the building. And then I got born again, got a hold of Brother Hagin, got a hold of Brother Copeland, mainly Brother Copeland at that time, and uh, I messed up the whole testimony meeting. I want to thank God that I'm saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, hallelujah, and I'm going through to the end. Want to come with me? And that messed it up. <laughs> you know? <laughs> the arrogance of youth. Hallelujah. But I got saved. And um, I was headed to Holmes College of the Bible in Greenwood, South Carolina. That was the PH Church's Holy Ground Bible College. Now, they had Evangel down in Georgia, out, outside of Franklin Springs, outside of north of, Georgia, of Atlanta. And, uh, but I was headed to Holmes College of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Going to cause the Holy Church going to support you. You know, now, hair can't touch your ears. Can't touch your collar, you know. Janie was so upset because she thought I was going to turn into a mama's boy. <laughs> and we were dating. We weren't married. And, um, and in the process of, the, of me getting saved and saying, well, I'm going to homes, and, you know, a, a guy in our church um, handed me a little booklet. The booklet was, was, was rectangular shape. I'm not getting to my notes in case you're wondering. And that, that never happens, does it? Okay. All right. And on the front, it said Rama. Opened it up, and there was this full color on black black print logo, Rama Bible Training Center. You know, then you open a picture of Brother Hagen and, you know, Pastor Hagen. 
and uh, the, some students from that year, and, um, and it was about Rama. It was, it was advertisement. He said, if I was going to go to school, this is where I'd go. And I looked at, and looked at the, how much tuition was, put it down, thought, I can't afford that. I ain't, listen, I don't know anything about faith. I'm just, I just got saved. All I know is, I love Jesus! I mean, everywhere I went, stop signs turned into go signs. I mean, all kinds of stuff. I'm, I'm just, that's a joke, guys. Come on. Y'all supposed to catch that. That's all I know. I don't know anything about faith. I had a Fiat 124 sports spider, and on the dash is a Strong's Concordance, a Amplified Bible, and the Rumley Choke the Mule Bible. It was a big old Bible that I bought from Sister Rumley. She sold them. It was, a, it was an ASV King James Parallel Bible with study notes, stuff, and it's about that thick and about that big. That, that's what I went to church with. I didn't know nothing. <laughs> Argue with people, you know? So I, I, knew, I, I knew everything, but I knew nothing. So I'm headed to Holmes College of the Bible. And um, so that was the summer after I got saved, up in, um, say, 1979, 1980. No, 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 no. In that year between 1979 and 1980, this is all going on. Well, Christmas comes up of, of 79, and my family bought me luggage to go to homes with and all this stuff. And then I'm sitting there. I, ain't, I hadn't even sent in the application. Every time I tried to pick up that application and send it in, I couldn't do it. I could not send it in. And, of course, you know, Grandma's happy. He's going to homes. And there's not, there's a, there's a I have no discredit on that school. They love God. They're, they're, they're Pentecostal. They, you know, loved you. Our pastor that we had at the time in that church went there. Him and his wife met there. It was, you know, you know Bible college for the, for the denomination. I'm not demeaning them. Okay? But see, when your destiny or your purpose is along a different line and God has other things, you have to follow the Holy Ghost. I didn't know how to be led by the Spirit, but I was being led by the Spirit. I didn't know what it meant, okay? I just knew in my Pentecostal church, when the Holy Ghost got on you, you shouted, you spoke in tongues, you ran around the building, and that was about it. Woo! <laughs> we did the Pentecostal chicken. Y'all remember Pentecostal chicken? And then, of course, we had to stop doing that when the Tulsa two-step came in. That little Jewish thing, you know, we did. We thought that was spiritual. Dear Lord, because we weren't doing that chicken thing. You know, anybody Pentecostal in here? Know what I'm talking? You grew up Pentecostal. You know what I'm talking about? Janice, Jerry, y'all Pentecostal. Rest of y'all weren't. Y'all came out of the dried up stuff. <laughs> I, I'm messing with you. I'm messing with you now. I'm just trying to be funny now. Brother Bill came out of the Baptist Church, Southern, with a D, not a P, you know, Baptist. B-A-B-D-I-S-T. Isn't that right? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And you know what? Thank God for the Baptists because the Pentecostals wouldn't have anybody to get filled with the Holy Ghost if it weren't for the Baptists. They're getting, they're getting saved. We get them filled. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, so I'm not demeaning that. You know, great school. A lot of good people have gone there. A lot of good people have done a lot for the kingdom of God. Okay. Mm -hmm. But my call, my purpose, my destiny was a different path. But I didn't know that. You understand what I'm saying? I didn't know that. And so I, every time I pick up that application to go send it and put it in the mail, I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. And so finally, um, my family said, you're not going there. I said, no. Nah. I said, why not? I said, I don't know. I just can't go. That's all. I, I, didn't, I couldn't say that I met this Holy Ghost told me. I didn't say God told me not to go. I, I didn't. I couldn't, have, I, couldn't get, I couldn't speak charismatic ease. I didn't know it. Okay? I hadn't learned it yet. All I knew was something on the inside wouldn't let me do it. And so went through that part of the year, and, um, and then some things happened. And I was, I was uh, down at Atlantic Beach, North Carolina, walking down the beach talking with someone. And uh, they were talking about, you know, my life and, you know, what, what God, you know, what, what they, I thought God was doing. And they said something. And when they said it, I started jumping up and down. Woo! I'm going to Rhema. I'm going to Rhema. Because what they said immediately unlocked in me, I'm supposed to go to Rhema. 
Then the thought did not come, how am I going to go to Ramah? <laughs> okay? I just said, I'm going to Ramah. And um, that was in, oh gosh, March, April of that year, 1980. Uh, by July of 1980, I'm in, I'm in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Getting ready to go to Rainbow Bible Training College Center. Center back then, it's a college now. And all kinds of things happened. My, my tuition got paid for the whole year. Okay? How I even got out there, I don't know. I was in, I was in a demon mobile. I had an AMC Gremlin. Y'all look up Gremlin in Thesaurus. It says, uh, 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 not Thesaurus. Is it Thesaurus? Well, you get, when you get all the synonyms, yeah. See, we look at the synonyms for it. Demon, imp. Gremlin, I mean, all kinds of different titles for what the Gremlin had. And mine had demons in it, especially in the windshield wipers. They were vacuumed. They had a hole in it. I mean, you, you had to turn off, let it get enough suction to pull them up one time. So you could ride down the road like this. So I, I got that demon car out to Oklahoma. It must have the devils cast out of it because we, I was able to get through the school year. Went to Raymond Bible Training College, and here I am. Now, when I got saved, I knew I, 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 there was a sense of call, but I thought I didn't know what it was all about. Then I'm going to homes, and then God won't let me go to homes. Then Rama comes, and um, Rama, and I graduate from Rama Bible Training College in um, 1981. Now, this is that page that was the second page of that book, right here. It was, it was, actually this page is shaped like this. This is my diploma from Rainbow Bible Training College. And I had this, we had this done in Greenville years ago. But this right here is that book. A page from that book. Where he handed it to me and it sat in my room for months and months and months and months. And me looking at it going, I can't afford that. The homes application right next to it to send off I could never send off. I sent this off, and two weeks later, I had a response. Hallelujah. And so, and then, of course, the diploma that, you know, signed by Dad Hagen, Pastor Hagen. <coughs> when I started, I didn't know where I was headed. And see, that's only the beginning in ministry. I come back to Greenville. We were in our Pentecostal Holiness Church, and my pastor had once us up, but God had already told us about it, this new church that had started up. Nothing wrong with it. We had a wonderful pastor. L sincere, precious man of God. Still is, you know. And he's not in ministry. He's not in full-time ministry. He does visitations and stuff for the church and stuff. But he's, he's actually still in that city. He still lives in Greenville. And um, his, sister, his wife, Sister Gentry, went home um, maybe a year, maybe a year, a year and a half ago. She went home to be with Jesus. And, um, but, you know, precious man of God. He said, actually, we had him come preach at the church one time. Years ago, over in the business park, uh, he came and preached. And uh, love him. I mean, he just, you know. But he, he said, I, I've got something I want to do. But the Lord already told us to move over to this other church. You know. It was a charismatic word of faith, you know. And. My, my, my destiny was not with the PH church. I, had, I thank God for my Pentecostal roots. How do they, I do. I love my Pentecostal roots. I'm glad I have them. All right? I, 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 I experienced things growing up, you know, being around the old saints that I, I couldn't have gotten somewhere else. I thank God for it. I'm, I'm thankful for it. But my destiny was not there. I didn't understand that. I didn't know that. So we went over to this other church. Well, our pastor gets hooked up with, you know, everybody. So we've got, you know, we've got uh, Buddy Harrison, Kenneth Hagin's son-in-law coming in. We have, you know, oh gosh, I can't, I can't, Les Summerall came. That was an event. I'm sitting in the green room with Sister Summerall and asked her if she wanted something to drink. And she said, no, thank you. And of course, you know, I'm a southerner. You have to ask twice. And they'll take it on the second time. I, I made the mistake of asking her twice. Because she looked at me and her eyes got real beady. And she stared right at me. She said, young man, I said I didn't want any. 
I said, if you need anything, I'm outside the door. <laughs> she was a minister in her own right, way before she ever met Brother Summerall. She was down in South Africa as a single missionary going on through there when they met. Hallelujah. And so, you know, here I am. I'm graduated from Rama. I'm, I'm, I'm in this church. I'm working. And all these de people are coming in, Dennis, Burke, you know, I mean, just kind of a hodgepodge about anybody you could think of in the charismatic world. They were, they were all flowing through our church. And I was, I was getting to spend time with them. See him, remember see him, Ward? You know, we got to have dinner with him and, and sit in the room with about 12 ministers and him talk, talk and share with us. And, you know, I mean, just that, that was more valuable than the service was to me in that room with him. Okay. And um, uh, we had all just those different things going on. God's planting and God's sowing and God's preparing and God's connecting things that you have no idea. And I'm going to tell you something. Now, this is my particular ministry, but in your own life, God is sowing, God is planting, God is establishing, God is equipping, God is doing things for you for your personal destiny. And you may not see the end right now. All you can see is right here. And there are things in your heart about wanting to serve God and do for God. You know, and you can't see how you can get them here in this little church down in Pleasant Garden. A little church in Pleasant Garden ain't going to be a little church in Pleasant Garden forever. I said it's not. Hallelujah. I know this. God brought us here. Not, he did not bring us out here. We are not going to out like the children of Israel. Did he bring us out here to die in the wilderness? <laughs> Hallelujah. No. He brought us out here because there's a purpose, there's a destiny. We don't see it all. Okay? And so over the years, I worked in that church for, you know, five, six, you know, uh, until 1987. Jesse was born in 86, 1987. We came here. And we went through a bunch of stuff, but we met, but we had connections made. And then as we came here, more connections were made. And every one of those connections led to the next step. I'm not going to go into the full details of everything right now. Every, every connection led to the next step. And you could sit. Now, one thing was, Mark, Mark Brzee, we, we had, um, he had, was going to go down to Asheboro and preach at a church. And we knew who Mark Brzee was by name because Brother Hagen would talk about him. He was one of the people that the girls were going to get married to were sending out invitations. And they hadn't even got, weren't even dating them. They were using their faith. Enough said. <laughs> you know, I, and they say, these, these guys aren't even interested in y'all. We don't receive that in Jesus' name. That's a negative confession. <laughs> you have to have a basis for faith. Okay? And if they're not interested, that's a, not a basis for faith. All right. So anyway, and um, Mark asked me to go to his, one, his Bible schools he started in, in Europe. And so I, I started going to Estonia and different ones. Went um, over the years to different ones several times, and, and just just really ma we made connections there that now are um, connecting us with things and things that we that we established have, have helped um, even them go where they're going because people know who we are, okay, and from those connections and so forth. But it, it perpetuates on to other things. So, um, but I remember after we had done all the European stuff, we're doing the European Bible schools. And that, that thing in the Orient was just uh, still back there. Remember that? That thing in the Orient that God kind of spoke to me at the very beginning? I didn't really. Well, after about five years of going to these different schools, um, I get Mark Brzee's newsletter opened up. And he said, the Lord told me what we did in Europe will work in Asia. And I start uh, jumping up and down again. Because as soon as I saw that, the, I thought the Lord went, there it is. You know what I told you when you first got saved? There it is. I called the office right away. I want to go. And in Bangkok, Thailand, um, February of 1997, I step, uh, 1999, I step off the airplane onto the tarmac in Bangkok, Thailand. And all this stuff had happened to get me there that I couldn't see how that fit the puzzle. How many, how many of you ever put a, like a thousand piece puzzle together? And you're going, and you're going, and you're going, and you're going, and you're going. All of a sudden, you put that last piece in, and you went, click, and go, wow. But you look at all the pieces, you're thinking, how in the world is this going to fit together? 
And so your destinies are like that. You don't know all the, you don't know everything. You may kind of have an idea of how the end, it's going to end up, but you don't know all the stuff in between. You pick up that picture of the puzzle and you're looking at all those things pieces on there. There ain't no way. And you put that last piece in and you're like, ooh. It's exactly like it looks on the box, except for all the lines everywhere. Okay? And um, that all, all of that was twists and turns and this and that and moving. But we ended up right where God said. Hallelujah. I never, I never forget it. I'll never forget that, 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 that event. And so, although we didn't know our, everything about our destiny from the beginning, it happened, and God, there was twists and turns, and this and that, and that thought, you, you thought, well, this is going to be this way, and it wasn't, it wasn't anything like you thought it was going to be. Amen? Now, this brings me to this. Where are we at? Where are we? Woo. <laughs> Spent more time there than I thought I was going to spend. Y'all got that? Now, secondly to this, don't ever believe that people who've made it never missed it. Because the Bible is full of people who made it who missed it and missed it more than once. Let me just give you an example, David. Now, you're talking about the king of missing it. David was that guy, all right? I mean, you know, he just, he, he, didn't, he didn't exactly have everything hit right in all the cylinders all the time. What do you mean? Y'all remember Bathsheba? Now, I know you probably saw the movie on television or, or the theaters or whatever when Hollywood came out with David and Bathsheba and made it a love story. It was not a love story. It was a lust story. Hello? There was a time of the year the kings went out to battle, but David remained behind in Jerusalem. What does that mean? He wasn't supposed to be there. Every woman in the city could have been on the rooftop butt naked, and he wasn't supposed to see it because he was supposed to be at battle. But since the king's palace is the highest of the city, and I'm, here's, my, here's my speculation. We don't really have this for, for certain. My speculation is David heard the rumors that while the men were out, they went up, and, in, and, and took baths on the roof of their uh, houses because there weren't any men around. And so it was okay. Okay? Nobody was going to see them. Butt naked. Taking a bath on the roof. Except David stayed behind. Because he probably heard the rumor. He thought, I'm going to check this thing out. And he checked it out too much. Because then he caused Bathsheba to come over. Lies with her. She's married, so he's not committed adultery. She sends her back home. Well, one night fleeing, nobody will know about it, except she gets a, he gets a note a little while later. I'm pregnant! <laughs> Let's see. This is, uh, this is April. The men have been gone since January. Um, she just found out. And I was with her in March. Mm -hmm. Send her husband back from the battlefield. And he figures they're going to be out there for a while. So he sends him, he gets him come back. He brings him in the house. Says, okay, da -da -da. And I went, went to inquire what's going on in battle. Now go home and sleep with your wife. Basically, he said, go home and sleep with your wife. But he gets Mr. Boy Scout. It was dishonorable for him to go sleep with his wife while his brother were fighting. So he sleeps outside. And David had sent his servant to follow him. He goes, comes back and says, man, he didn't go in the house. He, he's outside sleeping. He calls back to the palace, gets him drunk. Well, if I get him inebriated enough, he'll, it'll lower his moral code, his standards, sends him back home. He still won't sleep with his wife. Brings him back and says, okay, I got a problem here. Because she's going to show up pregnant. He's going to be gone. Everybody going to know somebody else been in the house but besides her husband. So he sends back with his own death sentence. Has him murdered. That doesn't mean nothing that you call it. He was murdered. Then he go after her days of weeping her and, and, and grieving her over, he calls her in and marries her and takes her as his wife. All right? Yet God, David becomes the greatest king of Israel. 
Nathan shows up, not this one. That's who he's named after. Okay. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, one rich, one poor. And the rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds. The poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb. All right. Which he had brought, bought, nourished up, and grew it together with him uh, and with his children, and did eat his own meat, and drank of his own cup, and lay in the bos his, his bosom, and uh, was with him as uh, him as a daughter. I mean, did I miss something there? I'm trying not to put on my glasses. Okay. Okay. And there came a traveler to the rich man. He spared to take his own flock and his herd to dress it for the wayfaring man that was coming to him. But he took the poor man's lamb, dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger and wrath was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, and as that, and, and that the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And David said to, uh, uh, Nathan said to David, you be the man. I know King James says, thou art the man, you be the man. And David gets up off his throne and, and repents. You see, Samson missed it. David missed it. How about Father Abraham? Lord Hammer. Lion Abraham. Remember? When we get there, they're going to kill me and take you because you're a good-looking woman. Sarah, you're beautiful. What are they going to do? They're going to kill me and take you. So tell them you're my sister. Yeah. They get there. This is my sister. Man, you scumbag. Look at that. You sorry rascal. Going to take your wife and give her up so you don't get killed. That's what he was doing. Abraham, folks, the father of our faith. Now, the king brings her over to the palace. I mean, he's thinking, man, whoo! We're going, I mean, let's, 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 let's just, I mean, shake it up, steer it up, little darling. Some Marvin Gaye, whatever you're thinking of. I mean, he's saying he's got him a hot date tonight, baby. And then he has a vision. <laughs> and he, call, he calls Abraham and says, man, I'm going to paraphrase. Man, are you crazy? You sent your wife over here. Now God's about to take me out. Get that woman out of here. Nathan, well, man, I thought you were going to kill me to get her. So, you know, it was the plan. Yeah. Then circumcision is given. Guess what he doesn't do? No, Moses, Moses doesn't circumcise his son. Yeah, Moses is following, supposed to be following all this. Moses doesn't circumcise his son. And the angel shows up. He's about to get taken out because he disobeyed God. And the wife uh, uh, circumcised him on the spot to stop it. Why? Why? Because they weren't in covenant. They blew it. This goes on and on and on. You go through those guys in the Hebrews uh, uh, chapter 11 Hall of Faith, and you got a bunch of folks who missed it. I don't mean like little stuff. We're talking big, major, blow it. Yet they still fulfilled their destiny. Why? Because you see, God knows the beginning from the end. God knows how to restore. As Richard Roberts used to say, he's the God of the second chance. And I got news for you, he's the God of the third chance and the fourth chance and the fifth chance. And, okay. God, I'm, you know, some of you need, you know, infinity chance. He's the God of the infinity chance. Okay. Why, why can we go? Why is this? Because call it back to what we said at the very beginning. God's for you. God's on your side. God's not against you. Can you say amen? And so that leads us into this next point. You've only got one chance to get it right. And that's just not true. You've got more than one chance. Now, you don't bank on that. You don't think, well, I got cat has nine lives, I got nine chances to get it right. You don't bank on that, but when you have missed it, and you know that you're not where you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, and you know where you're not supposed to be, and you go to God. It's not going to be, okay, listen, I told you last week that was the last chance you had. You don't get that from God because God's for you. 
Jesus is ever living to make intercession for you. Hallelujah. When you're messed up, he's praying, get him right. Can you say amen? He's, 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 if he died for you while you were dead in your trespasses and sins, how much more is he going to reach out for you when now you're alive unto God and his child? And I'm not going to go Armenian Pentecostal on you. You know, you just die, you lose your salvation, you got to get saved again. Anybody got a Dates analytical Bible? Okay, somebody got Dates. Now, Dates teaches in his Bible that man can be born again again. You know why he says that? You can be saved from drowning more than once. Well, that's a natural, you know, no, 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 no. You can't take some natural explanation and explain, you know, spiritual matters like that. Just because you can be saved by, from drowning more than once doesn't mean you can be born again, 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 again. You, don't, you may sin and you may miss it. You've got to repent. That's fine. You get cleansed by the blood of Jesus. But you don't get born again, again. Okay? All right? If God sent Jesus while you were dead in your sins, what's he going to do for you as a child? He's for you. Jesus is praying for you. And so you're, you're, you're not done. It's not over. You're not toast just because you blew it. Or you've blown it more than once. Because, see, God looks on the heart. And your heart yearns for him. And your, God, your heart wants to do right. And, your heart, and you're struggling with something. That's okay. It's, it's not okay that you're struggling with it. But it's okay that um, you keep coming because God will help you. Remember, he's for you, he's with you, he's in you, he's beside you, he's underneath you, he's upon you, and he takes up your rear guard. Hallelujah. And he's there to help you make it. Jesus had Peter walk with him for three years, three and a half years. I'll, I prayed for thee that when thou art converted, because he said, you're going you're gonna to deny me twice. Peter went, I mean, Peter turned in from cutting off the guy's ear to cussing. Remember? Centurions come out to get Jesus. Peter takes out the sword, cuts the guy's ear off. Saw a meme on Facebook the other day, and it had Jesus put an ear, putting it on this, this guy's head, and said, happy new ear. <laughs> Hallelujah. Kind of fit right there. <clears throat> Peter said, I'll die for you. Whack. A few hours later, I never knew him. The blankety blank, 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 blank. And then he went out and wept bitterly because the, chick the chicken told on him. Then out and twice, and then, and it won't because you had a sodium vapor street light outside your house. Janie's dad had one, that stupid rooster. We'd go stay with him. He thought that was the sun. He'd sit out there all night. Ar, 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 thinking, get a different color. Do something. That, that dumb chicken thinks that's the sun. <laughs> all night long. And then when the sun came up, he didn't do anything. Guess he was tired. You're like, how much longer is this going to go on? Okay. And so, um, remember in the New Testament, there was a ministry team. Paul, Barnabas, and they had a traveling companion, a young protege by the name of Mark. Remember him? And they were on a missions trip out doing the work of God. And they got... Um, Got to one place, and Mark went home. Yeah, Mark went home. Mark left the whole traveling team and went home. Well, on the next trip, they're getting ready to go out, and, and, and Paul and Barnabas get ready to go out, and Barnabas wants to bring Mark with him. And Paul said no. Why? Because he went back. They had a big argument. It was so big, it split up the Barnabas and Paul ministry team. Now, I'm, I'm kind of getting the King James off of it, you know, getting the little Elizabethan off of it, kind of clarify. They broke up a, the Paul and Barnabas worldwide ministry team <laughs> over Mark. 
because Barnabas believed in Mark. Paul was ticked off of Mark because he left him. See, even Paul had anger issues. You know, the teacher of grace had anger issues. And um, so Paul takes Timothy. He heads off one place. Barnabas takes Mark. And then that's kind of the end of that storyline because Acts follows Paul's ministry, not Barnabas's. Now, we get later on down the road. Now, would you say that Mark had missed it? I mean, he had a chance to sit under Paul all those years. But he went back. But we get to uh, Paul writing to Timothy later in his ministry and says, Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. See, Barnabas didn't let it go. Barnabas worked with this young protege who made mistakes and kept him. And then finally Paul comes back and says, bring him. He's profitable. He went and had that one shot, and it was over. Now, I know ministers that are like that. You just one shot and you're done, you know. And, and I, I, I just don't see that being like the Lord would have us be like. People make mistakes in youthfulness. They make mistakes in youthful arrogance. Okay? People make state mistakes in churches. Hello? Okay? They make, they make mistakes in serving. But God sees what he gifted them with. And God sees what he called them with. Whether it's ministry, whether it's service, whatever it is, my gifts and my callings are without repentance, says the Lord. What he gave, he doesn't take back. Amen? And so, we have to understand that it's not everybody knows where they're heading. In most cases, most people don't. How it's going to work out. What it's going to look like. <clears throat> That's okay. Amen? Not everybody, um, <laughs> well, everybody does miss it. I'm just going to say you real flat and tell you ahead of time. You're going to miss it. And you'll miss it more than once. That's a negative confession. I don't care. It's reality. You can't make a negative, you can't call something a negative confession that's, that's that kind of reality in, 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 in life and give people a false sense of something. Now, we may be believing God that we're not going to miss it and that we're here, God will always get it right every time. But the reality, we understand this. It would, there wouldn't be scriptures about if you confess your sin, if they were never going to miss it. Paul didn't write, declare in the name of Jesus, you'll never miss it, and it shall be. <clears throat> See, we took confession and made it into something that wasn't true. We made it into, uh, we made it into a doctrine that wasn't real, wasn't even obtainable. So we confess all kinds of stuff that's not even Bible. Well, you can have what you say as long as it lines up with the Word of God. You're going to take faith, and you're going to miss it. You're going to make mistakes. You've got to grow and learn through it and, uh, <coughs> and get it. <clears throat> and that's okay. That's part of your personal process of getting there. And it's not a sign of negativity that if, uh, like, well, I'm believing God to get healed. Well, we're having a healing service today. I ain't going up there. Well, I'm, I'm believing God. You know what? That might be your delivery, sir. Might you be the package being delivered from heavenly UPS. I'm going to close in here. We had um, Joe Morris was in with us years ago, and back in the building. It hadn't, it hadn't, actually hadn't been since we were in the business park. A lot of people hadn't been since we were in the business park. We only had like two or three guest speakers just because nothing's been advantageous. Shekinah Glory is working on coming, by the way. They want to get here this year. If you haven't ever seen them, you're going to need to bring your friends. You're going to need to be here. It is awesome. All right? And we'll, as soon as we can get some dates out of them, we're going to do it. Um, but Joe Morris, Joe flows in word of knowledge. Gifts of healing is a word of knowledge. That's part of his ministry. And so he's up preaching, and he stops and you know, near the end, starts ministering. People says, oh, there's somebody here with such such problem. And if Joe has gotten, see, when you know where you are in God, and you know the, what God said, you don't have to work it up. You don't have to fake it. And I don't believe in faking it until you make it either. So, you know, I don't believe in that fake stuff. And 
He's sitting out there. And, no, of course, now some people get uncomfortable. I gave a word and nobody responded. Brother Hagin said he's had people fall dead in his prayer line. He said, what would you do? Went on and prayed for the next person. Can't help them? Go on and pray for the next guy. And people get healed. You say, how? He just, he, he let the anointing flow and let the anointing work. So Joe calls us out and nobody responds. So he, he calls out something else and ministers to somebody. And calls he says, now I'm still waiting on that person with such and such. And nobody's responding. He goes on ministers to several other people in the same way, you know, word of knowledge. They're coming up, praying for him. And finally, the woman's sitting back where Benny is in the church. And he, he walks over there and he just stands there. Now, now God shows me that somebody has such, such, such now, now, is that you? And they just look at him. Are you sure? And he just stands there, calls out several other people, ministers to them. Now the Lord showed me. <laughs> this goes on for 10 or 15 minutes of this back and forth. And, and this woman's going, mm -mm, ain't me, ain't me, ain't me. And finally, she goes, well, I prayed and believed that I received, so I thought it was wrong for me to say that I had that. You're like, you should have drank a V8. You've been praying and believing and receiving, and it, you're expecting to get it, get it without anything else. God sends it through a word of knowledge and a healing anointing to minister to you to get it here. That's how, that was his delivery method in that moment. And they're so hung up on, I made the confession. I believe for me to say anything else is a negative confession. No, stupid. Sign the paper. Take the package. God sent it. Here it is. It took 15 minutes to get that woman to understand, I mean, from the, from the beginning of the whole process, for her kind of realization that God was speaking. I mean, he said specifically what she was dealing with. <clears throat> That's a telltale sign. Hello? The, the, the guy, Joe really is a prophet, walks over to you. You haven't done anything to indicate it's you. And looks at you and says, are you the one? Mm, ain't me. I got my confession. Now, let me ask you all something. How many of you are stuff on Amazon? You, I mean, anything. Some of you are going, my God, what do you think I heat my house with? <laughs> Amazon boxes. I mean, you know, I got stacked up. That's the firewood. We just roll it up and throw it in the fireplace. Okay? Now, you, 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 can you imagine? You got, you got something you order from Amazon. It's got to be signed for. It's not just on the porch. You got to sign for it. You order something, doorbell rings. Guy from Amazon standing there with a package, your name's on it. Hello? He says, can you sign for this package? No, nope, that's not my package. I've already believed that I received my package. I got the receipt online. I have, I have my package. Yeah, I know. That's why I'm here. No, nope, that's no, nope, no. Nope. I received my package. How did you think it was coming? Hello, I'm not signing for that. I've already got it. It's mine. In Jesus' name, I received that package. It's my package. I have it. Glory to God. I've already possessed it in my heart, saying all the right charismatic confession things. And the guy's going, I know. I'm here. Here's your package. Has your name on it. Hmm. Now, wouldn't y'all think he's stupid? If you were there watching that, you go, hey, that, that is an idiot. But we'll do it in church with the things of God. Not realizing God has other words. God's not limited to your idea of how it's got to show up. That's great when you believe that you receive it. In the instant you're healed nothing, and, and there's nothing external. But what if he chooses to do it differently? Well, I don't go to the doctor. Great. Why don't you all tell Jesus that he should have had Luke on his ministry team? You know who Luke was? He was a doctor. Paul wrote and told Timothy, come on now, believe that you're healed from all your gastro uh, issues and receive it by faith in Jesus' name. Didn't he? You know what he said? No. He said, drink a little wine for thy stomach's sake, for thine often infirmities. He gave him a natural remedy 
because he was dealing with stomach problems all the time, and, and, and a little, the alcohol would help with the bacteria, uh, probably the water he was drinking. Now, he didn't say guzzle the bottle. <laughs> he was specific, a little, <laughs> okay, for medicinal purpose. But Paul, so don't discount a doctor in believing God. <clears throat> that may be what your delivery method is in that instance because of either where your faith level is or just because that's the way God did it. I remember Brother Hagin telling the story, and I can tell my own. Um, now, look, I, 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 I can now see you. Back in October, I couldn't hardly see you with this eye. You were a blur. This eye was, was not, this was a 2400. I was 2400 with Cadillacs. This was over 2040. And then when I got, I told Jane, she said, hey, I can see it at night now. She said, you know what bothers me? How long have you been riding around like that? <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, I, I didn't get anywhere. I was, I, it was just one of those things that kind of progressively got there. And I get, you know, <clears throat> so I went and had cataract surgery. Oh, you don't have any faith. I'll come back to that in a second. I'm 2015 now. I told the doctor, I'm, I'm you know, okay. He said, I said, what, what should I expect? He said, at least 2040 will be your, you know, in, in your eyes. You'll, you know, you'll be able to read, see everything with glasses. 2040. He said, a lot of times we'll get to 2030. Every once in a while we'll get to 2020. So, you know, he, he didn't really set a high bar for 2020. I get 2015. I'm believing God for 2015. I had a miracle. In fact, I got 2015. Hello? I, I do use them to read close up. All right? Um, so about 2015. Well, I keep riding around and almost having wrecks. You know, scaring my wife. She don't like the way I drive anyway. It was worse. Well, you don't have any faith. Well, look, and I'm not going to take my shoes off and show you my toe, but you all know about six years ago, uh, I had an ulcerated toe. I stepped on a nail in the summer, didn't realize it. It never got better. Kept doing, I kept thinking, I was just, you know, it's, it's where it is. I keep hitting it, keeps busting up. And, well, I wake up, go, come home from work one day, take my foot off, take my shoe off. Come take my foot off. You know, <laughs> <laughs> take my shoe off, and my toe is as bright, brighter than her shirt. It's about twice the size, and I'm thinking, I'm in trouble. Because that's my first thought. That's, that's something there. There's something wrong with that. That ain't right. So I called the doctor and, and, and got in, and uh, he said, you're in trouble. I said, well, what I need? He said, well, we're, I'm going to send you over here and have him x-ray it and um, see if it's, if it's in the bone because, you know, they don't want to get in the bone because it gets in your bone. Like, infections in the bone like to travel. They start cutting stuff off, you know. And so they said, the guy looks, well, it's not in the bone. We're just going to put you some antibiotics, da, 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 da. Well, that was, uh, <coughs> that was Friday morning, Friday, Saturday night. Sunday, Sunday, I'm in the garage, my toe's still kind of, it still don't look good, walk up the steps with no shoes on, kick it, and it busts open, and by the next morning, it's black, my toe is black, I mean black, and I go to the doctor, I, I, I skip work, I go to, the, go to the doctor, he said, this is good. I said, what do, you, what, do you, what do you need to do? He said, well, I can send you over to there, and they can do this. I said, he said, I can send you to the hospital. I said, what do you think I should do? He said, I want you in the hospital. So go to the hospital. It takes eight hours of waiting in the waiting room or six hours, whatever. Then finally, and my wife calls him and says, they ain't taking him back yet. He calls to get, uh, get somebody's case, and they get me back. And, um, and so they, you know, they, they put me on some stuff overnight. Mr. Hacky Wacky walks in the next morning. There's some Indian, Indian, India guy comes in. And he looks at my toe and he's telling the nurse, he says, well, this is gangrenous. How's that sound? Anybody, can anybody hear anything in there you wouldn't want to hear? Gangrenous. And I'm thinking, I heard that. He said, don't let him eat anything after such and such. We're going to take this off in the morning. And I'm thinking, you put your knife away, dude. You ain't getting my toe. That toe ain't coming off. And about two hours later, the, the, the podiatrist comes in, and he walks the door. I said, Doc, I'll do whatever you say do, but I wanna, I'm keeping my toe. 
And he gets and he says, but I don't think we're there yet. I said, I said, I know what to do. I know how to believe God. Now, he didn't respond to that a whole lot. But, you know, I'd say, he said, well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to put pick line in you. We're going to put you on uh, liquid antibiotics for six weeks. And I had to hook up twice a day, six weeks through this thing. And, uh, and then I go in every week to one of the doctors, him and Mr. Hacky Wacky. Go in two weeks later to Mr. Hacky Wacky. And he goes, well, it's better, but we probably still have to cut it off at the first knuckle. I'm thinking, no, you ain't. You ain't getting my toe. You ain't hanging in your trophy case. Now, by now, when they, they, they call it debrading, de they cut away all what they call slug. The skin that's just become mushy and lick, almost liquefied, they cut that off. And every two weeks, they're cutting that off because it's, it's, it's dead flesh. And it's gotten real soft and gooey, and just they just cut it off until it bleeds. I have a hole about the size of my finger all the way down to my bone in my big toe. And um, so I'm, I'm doing this football thing. I'm taking antibiotics. Listen to Brother Hagen all night long on healing. I'd wake up in the middle of the tape series when he got to the confession. I'd wake up in bed, and I'd start confessing with him. Body, you're healed. Now line up with the Word of God. I believe that I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. And make that confession and go back to sleep. And it didn't matter. I could be in the deepest sleep you can think of. And when that part of that tape series hit with that confession, I'd wake up and start confessing. And I did that the whole time. Well, I started going, and then I started going, and then um, the podiatrist started saying, well, it's smaller. And that was big. It's small. He's measuring it every time. And then when Hacky Wacky released me and let me go, he didn't want to see me anymore because I was, I was no longer infectious. The other doctor was going, he said, every time I'd go, it'd be half the size it was before. And half the size it was before. And half the size it was before. Now, now, I'm doing everything in the natural you, you needed to do. I got silver gel on it. I'm wrapping it. We're washing it out every night with saline solution. I'm doing everything. I'm, I'm, I'm changing my diet. You know, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. But I'm believing God. And, um, and so near the end, before I left the hacky wacky guy, I asked the nurse. I said, what did you think about my toe? She said, I didn't think you'd keep your toe. I asked for him. I said, now, Doc. Um, what did you think about it? He said, he said, well, the diagnosis was you weren't going to be able to keep your toe. He didn't want to admit anything, you know. He probably didn't understand. Got to the podiatrist doctor and asked the nurse. I said, um, it, was, it, was, it was a male nurse. And I said, what did you think about it? He said, when you came here, I saw that. He said, there ain't no way he's keeping that toe. And then I asked the podiatrist. I said, doc, what about my toe? He said, well, he said, people in your condition in that situation never keep their toe. He said, but whatever you did, you should be a case study. Because whatever you did, you have your toe. I said, Doc, I told you in the beginning, I knew that I believed God. He said, well, it worked. And then I went back to see him the next time. He I said, Mr. Taylor, I'm going to call that toe healed. I said, Doc, that's what I've been doing for four months. I've been calling that toe healed in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. I said, amen. amen. Now, I had cataract surgery. It, it, I got my, so I know how to believe God. It just, for whatever reason, I wasn't really either applying myself enough or, you know, but I, 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 I felt comfortable going getting surgery. Amen. I was comfortable with it. So do not, you can't go. We, we, when we first came here to Greensboro, the people had, who were in the church ahead of us, Believe that going to a doctor was a slap in the face of Jesus. That's crazy. God, you know, see, the Pentecostals, something that came out of there that was an error was you can only believe God. If you can't believe God, then there's something wrong with you. Well, I guess there's something wrong with Timothy. Now, thank God for you when you, 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 you believe God and you get the answer and you didn't have to do anything else. I've done that. Now, now, I was going to move from there. Dad Hagen. Dad Hagen. Healing ministry. Worldwide healing ministry. Wrote books on healing. Dad Hagen. Timothy Hagen. The healing evangelist. I was telling the story one time of how um, he got up one day and he was sick. I mean, he called Aretha and said, 
Aretha, and he starts he starts confessing, doing everything he's always done. And he ain't getting anything anywhere any better. And he's sitting there and he calls me and says, if I don't get some relief real soon, you're going to have to call Dr. So-and-so. And she almost fell out because she had never heard him say that. <laughs> call the doctor. And, um, and so she went to do something, get something, whatever. And he's laying on the bed. And the Lord said, didn't I tell you when I appeared to you and laid the finger of my right hand to the palm of your right hand and said, I've given unto thee a special anointing that when you lay that on the sick, they'll be healed of, the, of whatever uh, ails their bodies? He said, yeah. He said, it'll work for you just like it works for them. Now, see, before he'd always confessed it and believed he received it and got it. But the Lord wouldn't show him there's a different way. He said, lay your hands on your own self and you'll be healed. And he did. Now, here's what he said. Now, I'm, not, I'm just repeating him. He said, I laid my hands on me and said, in the name of Jesus, he said, it started coming out both ends. <laughs> <laughs> But he was healed. I mean, and it was over. He was healed. <laughs> That's what he said. I'm thinking, we didn't need that much information, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. But, the, but see, we are, he, he always confessed and gotten. God has different ways of delivering. And don't you ever feel condemned because a different way was used this time instead of I've had people make confessions. They'll never lay a knife on their body. And they didn't, and they died. Hello? That's a dangerous, that's a dangerous thing, Until, especially if you don't know the person that you're saying that about and really believes it. Hello? And I, I can tell you for a fact, because I was with them, and when they could talk, they didn't believe it. And it wasn't that they didn't want to. Their faith wasn't there. Their faith wasn't there. But they would say what somebody wanted them to say, so they, did, they wouldn't look unspiritual. And they died. Well, that's, you don't do that. I remember Dad talking about how he would go in the hospital and talk to people and sit there with, how did I get up? I don't know how I got up on this, but anyway, it's good. And talk to them and say, now let's pray, pray for you, be healed. They said, he said, can you agree with that? And he said, no, brother, I just, I, I just can't believe that. He said, what can't? See, he wanted to bring them up higher. This is what you got to do when you try to minister to people. You try to bring them up higher. If they can't go there, then you got to go down where they are. Why? Because you're not in agreement unless you do. And if two people agree as touching any one thing, see? Now, if you've got a special anointing and manifestation, so, you know, and listen, they still have to receive that. There's things you can get done with a special anointing. Sometimes you can't get done other ways. Hello? And even that, they got to be open to receiving it. I've prayed for people, and they don't want to go in and come right back out of them. Mm -hmm. Feel it. You can feel it. Feel it go out of your hand, come right back into you. So what do you do? Well, if you look at somebody and you're saying, and I, one, I can't make a confession for you that you don't believe. It won't work. Hello? I'm going to confess that, you know, you'll never have to go to the doctor the rest of your life. Well, what about, but I don't believe that. Well, I don't, you can't override them. Now, again, I'm going to say this. You can have a special anointing manifestation and things can happen that, that people, like, don't believe or not even in faith about. Let's put it like that. Like Brother Hagin. I'm just going to use his story again because it's, it's, it's right here. He's preaching in a service. And there's a woman up there. And we married a man who wasn't saved, and she'd been trying to get him saved for years, and he wouldn't, he wouldn't do anything to do with God. Finally got him to church one Sunday, Brother Hagin's there, and the Brother Hagin's, they're up in the balcony. He's going down praying for people. They're falling out in the spirit, and he's up there going, ah, he's knocking them down. I don't believe any of that. Just out loud. <clears throat> and the wife's sitting there, she's going, oh, God, why did I bring him? Why did I bring him? And she's embarrassed. Now, you can understand. Mr. Sourpuss out here. With his negative talk, he's knocking them down. I just out loud. And then Brother Hagin, now here Brother Hagin says, that, now that's the, their side of the story. I'm on my side of the story. I look up at the balcony, and the glory rolls in. He saw, uh, 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 it's a going all over me. It's a going all over me. It's a going all over me. And his wife turned and said, uh, what, what, what's it going all over you? He, he's, he's a, that a power he's talking about. It's a going all over me. Well, he had heart problems about to die. 
got healed. Well, you know he's not believing. He's out there mocking it. You see? So in those cases, see, you can't take an experience in the anointing and teach it as a doctrine. You can't go replicate that. Only the anointing can replicate that. You can't. If the anointing manifests that way, glory to God, we all rejoice in it. Otherwise, <coughs> what do we do? We come out, we give them the word, we pray with them, we agree with them where they are, and we believe God, and we try to bring them up that way until we can get them healed. And sometimes we're going to have to go to the doctor until they can get their faith there. Another story. A woman was in the church. Um, uh, she, was, she had a tumor. They kind of had to remove it back in the 40s and 50s. Taking a tumor out was not a minor thing. They just cut you open, opened you up, and took it out. Okay? And so this woman, she, he went to pray with her, brother, brother, sister, so-and-so, need, need to, oh, we're just going to believe God for that tumor to die with her. And she said, I don't know, Brother Hagin. She said, and so he knew her, what? He knew her faith wasn't there. He said, well, what can you believe? What can you believe? She said, I can believe the doctors will do a good job and they'll get it all out and there won't be. He said, okay, we'll pray there. What do you do? He said, I couldn't get her where I wanted to be. So I went down to where she was and prayed. Now, listen, listen to this whole story now. Prayed. They went in, did the surgery. He, he said, I'm going to do you one better. We're going to believe God. You're not going to have any, any pain and any, anything afterwards in Jesus' name. She said, I, okay. I. So he prayed with her, believed that. She went to surgery, came to the hospital the next day, and the doctor's out there in the hallway. He said, preacher, I'm going to tell you one thing. That's a miracle in there. That's nothing but a miracle. He said, what are you talking about? He said, he said we came by last night to give her morphine for pain. She said, I don't need it. He said, you've got to be in pain. Cutting, laying there with your belly cut wide open. She said, well, I don't have any. He said, I'm giving it to you anyway. Gave it to her. He said, and that's the only shot she got. She says, he said, that's, I'm going to tell you, that, that's nothing short of a miracle. Now, here. That's the story. But then next time, any other time after that, she needed healing, she could get it. Didn't have to, you know, didn't have to go back to, back to the doctor. But it, it did something in her and her faith. And she reached and she built, built and developed and grew. And it didn't matter what it was, she'd get healed instantly. You see? You got, you, you, you just, we got, we got to learn that, and, not, and we can't condemn people if they're not where we are. Maybe you're in that place, you're able to just go, man, praise God. And you got that revelation, you're walking in it, and they're not. Well, don't condemn them, help them. Agree with them where they are. Let them learn. God does heal. God does do those things. Let them see the manifestation. This is this young man, the football player. He was dead on the field. He was dead for 12 minutes. And they were pumping his heart and giving him oxygen, but he was dead. <coughs> but prayer has gone up. I mean, pray for him. Apparently, he's, he's, he's a committed Christian. His mama's a committed Christian. I mean, you know, the football players out there, they're Christians out there praying on the field. I mean, he was dead. And they're saying now it looks like he has no neurolo even neurological damage, which he should have some from the lack of oxygen. Okay? He'll never be the same. People who, who watch that will never be the same. Commentators on ESPN who are praying for him on, on, on international TV are not going to be the same. See, they're going to go up a level. You understand? And so I, I know we, we digressed away from destiny and purpose, but we have got to understand that if you're dealing with stuff in your body, and de it is not some type of condemnation to go to a doctor. We are not Jehovah's Witnesses. No blood transfusions or anything. You know, you're just going to die. Yeah, blood transfusions save life. Nope, nope. No, only God can do that. Only God can do that. He's, he's the one. No, you idiot. Hello? Y'all hear you going home. Now, what's the highest? Believe in God and receiving without, without anything else. That's the highest level. Are people there? Sometimes. Majority. Usually not there. They're working there. We're growing there. We're developing there. We're not there. Hello? Well, I'm just going to see the doctor or die. Well, dummy, we just make sure you know what songs you want sung. <laughs> Hello? 
It's not that we're against believing God. We preach it. We teach it. We love it. We want you to. But if you're not there, you're not there. Where are you? We'll get there and agree with you where you are, and we'll, we'll go together and come up. Amen? I don't need to be singing, you know, just as I am without one plea, or, you know, where the roll will be caught up yonder, I'll all be there, or, you know, whatever else that we sing. I'll fly away. There's a good funeral song. I'll fly away, oh, glory. Yeah, we're going to sing I'll fly away. You want to say I'll fly away singing at your funeral? No. It's not a condemnable offense to go to a doctor. Are you here? I thought you all are faith church. We are. I have my toe by faith. Still went to the doctor, but I have my toe. I can tell you right now, I got a toe down there. It's got a scar down the side of it. Like they like say, I bear in my body the marks. <laughs> I'm reminded every time I look at that. And when I, if I go get a pedicure, you go get a pedicure. Yes, sir, buddy. I nothing feels better to that calf than a pedicure. They massage your calf and your feet and your feet. Yes, sir, baby. So you are a man. You got that right. And it is heavenly. <laughs> I have no problem with it at all. I'm trying to teach my son. That's a good thing to do. He's like, <laughs> Go ahead, dummy. It feels good. And I'm ticklish. And they love to tickle my feet because I, I, I start acting crazy. Now, there's nothing wrong with that visit to the doctor. And sometimes you just need to go to find out what you're fighting. Sometimes you can find, okay, this is what I'm dealing with. You can put your faith on it instead of the unknown. The unknown can bring more fear than the known. I've seen people do things in fear about the unknown, suspecting or thinking it was one thing and it wasn't, just because they were afraid. So, I know it was a little bit of a side journey, but don't, don't let that inhibit you from God. Amen? Amen? Grunt, say, help me, Jesus. Turn around and walk out the door with your finger up like a church finger and, you know, I'm out of here, whatever. <laughs> Over here. God knows his thoughts toward you, thoughts of good and not of evil to give you an expectancy. Next week we're going to tell you how to find your destiny. Okay? Or, or be in preparation for knowing your destiny. Okay? Next week. Um, you, don't know where, you don't know everything about where you're heading. Bible people missed it. Bible people didn't know everything. You, and you're not either. Okay? Amen. All right. Uh, before we close today, since we got to talking about healing, um, we do believe in laying on of hands. We do believe that, that uh, the anointing of God is available to heal the sick. And if you're here this morning, you need uh, let's lay hands on you, minister to you in Jesus' name. We'd like for you to come up and let's, let, let us pray for you. Anybody here have something you need from, from the Lord that way today? We are more than glad to pray for you in Jesus' name. Yeah. That's, that's the problem in the faith church. You get people to talk so good sometimes. They don't, they don't need anything. <laughs> well, go get me some folks who need something. Okay, go, 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 get, go get the halt, the lame, the withered. Bring them in here so we can pray for them. Amen? Amen. Praise God. No, nobody? Nobody? All right. Praise God. All right. Good to have the Poplins. Good to have the Winfrey's. Good to hope you all come back and be with us again. Um, see us. We'd love to see you again. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. And anything else? All right. Glory to God. All right. Thank you for joining us today. We're glad you're here. We'd love to have you visit with us in person. We're located at 6302 Walter Wright Road in Pleasant Garden, North Carolina, 27313. And uh, we have services Sunday mornings at 1030, Wednesday night at 7, prayer on uh, Zoom prayer. Tuesdays at 7, glory to God. Till we meet again, remember these words from 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4, that whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Walk with God, go with God, be blessed in Jesus' name. See you next time here at Expedition.